Let's get one more round of applause. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, I, I'll just go ahead and have each of you introduce yourself and talk about your role in the film. Sure, I'm Scott Ferris. Uh, I co-directed the film with Meg and shot most of it, though not all of it. We had a lot of help from local talented filmmakers like Ben and Justin who are, are running the festival, as well as the fabulous folks at Coat of Arms who did our motion graphics. Gotta get that plug in. Their brilliant feature film, O Pioneer, is coming up next, so stick around for that. Um, I'm Meg Griffiths. I co-directed and produced the film. I'm Ayn Amjad, and I'm one of the characters in the film. So we have uh, microphones up here, and I'd encourage anybody in the audience that has any questions, please come up here um, and ask questions uh, of this talented team that's up here. Um, but I'll get us kicked off. Um, Scott, for, for me, I just wanted to hear from you about, you know, what did it mean for you to come back home and be able to tell a story like this? I mean, you, you all put a lot of time and effort into this, but what did it mean for you, you know, as a native West Virginian to come back and tell this story? Yeah, Meg and I have worked together for well over 10 years making primarily short documentaries. And one of the things that we recognized really early on in our work together is that anytime we have the opportunity to tell a story in a place that feels like home, um, and there are different states for each of us that are home, the work is that much better, that much more poignant. We are that much more invested in what we're doing. So we make our best work when we're telling those stories from home. And so for the longest time, we were looking for an opportunity to come to West Virginia, which is my home, and tell a story that felt impactful, tell a story that felt real, that felt like a different take on uh, what is often a misunderstood or misrepresented place. Um, and for a long time, we waited for a client to hire us to tell a story here. And at a certain point in late 2018, we just realized, if we really wanna do this, we've gotta find the story ourselves. And so we reached out to folks that we knew in the state and almost immediately talked to one of Ayn's former high school classmates who said, you should really talk to my friend, Ayn Amjad. I think she's trying to move a town or something. And we were like, well, that sounds fascinating. We have to know more. And so that's, that's really how it, it all got started. That's fantastic. And what was the process like, you know, once you heard the story, you know, talk a little bit about from the documentary side about what, you know, how did you start gathering facts? How did you start, you know, finding out the full breadth of what was going on? Well, Ayn was so generous. I mean, I think Scott called her Christmas of 2018 and introduced himself and said, you know, we're interested in learning more about the work you're doing in Minden and what's happened there. She said, come on down with your cameras. And we thought it was going to be a short and then we very quickly realized we had a much um, bigger story on our hands. And Ayn kept it very interesting with all the twists and turns in her career and her life. Um, but really, it was just spending time. I mean, we didn't have a plan, actually. We really just went and spent the time. I mean, I think we captured 400 hours. We took 18 production trips to West Virginia over the course of four years. We kept in touch with people as much as we could, given that we live in Los Angeles. Um, and people just really opened their hearts and their homes to us. And there are so many hours of footage on the cutting room floor that were like, we have to make shorts about some of the other incredible people we met. But really, it was just putting in the time. It's amazing. Um, so Dr. Amjad, I have a question for you. Um, watching this film, the, the idea of courage comes to my mind because we talk a lot about access when we're filming stories um, with subjects that are in our films. Can you talk us through what it was like to experience this and also what it was like to kind of let your life unfold and for us to watch it? Well, it, it was uncomfortable, obviously. Um, and I, 
You know, when I first met Scott and Meg, we thought it would just be a short interview, maybe one or two trips, and I'd, you know, done interviews before, but um, then slowly it became more than that, and of course they were always lingering in the background. My family was there a lot, and they thought it was strange too, you know, but after a while you get used to it, and I got so comfortable with them, and of course I've become great friends, so I, I it isn't... It's a very vulnerable position, too, to be up there speaking about my personal life and just talking off the cuff. But, um, you know, that's what it is. That's what life is. So it's, it's interesting to see it on that screen. I have to share a little memory I have, Justin, which is like, oh, oh I'm so sorry. Like the third or fourth time we came to Beckley to, to film with Ayn, I remember we walked into her parents' home and Lolly looked up and she was like, you're still here? What are you doing back? <laughs> that was in year one of four, by the way. <laughs> I think Lolly asked us on every subsequent trip, uh, when are you going to be done? Yeah, like, why, why are you coming back? Though so she was a very gracious host. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, please. Add that on. Hi. Uh, beautiful film. I'm from Fayette County, not that area, but a different part. So I just appreciate your time with the story, because often, I mean, you're from here, I'm from here, we're filmmakers, um, and often you get, yeah, the parachute journalist style of filmmaking, and so I appreciate that dedication and time. And I think as a filmmaker, I'm always curious, and you talked just now a little bit about it with Ben's question, but I guess, you know, on seeing yourself on there and just thinking about there's always this camera present, like, how did you build that relationship? You say you're friends now, but I'm, I'm just always curious, like, as a filmmaker, right, we protect the people that we're filming um, and we build these relationships and it blurs these lines that aren't journalistic, right? There's, it's really muddy. And so I'm just curious how you all kind of navigated that space for both filmmaker and participant in the film. That's a really great question. Um, I'll give my take just because I'm holding the microphone and then I'd love your take. I am really curious for your, for your answer to this question. Um, Meg comes from a journalism background, but my background is, is narrative filmmaking. And I think that was helpful because I think we think about the role of documentary a little bit differently. Um, Meg brings a kind of uh, set of journalistic ethics to the work that we do. And I was always pushing her to try to capture the emotional truth of the situation or the characters that we were spending time with. And sometimes those two things are in conflict. They can lead you to make different decisions. But I think ultimately what we always uh, fell back on was do we feel comfortable showing this to Ayn? Which we did. We, sh we did show her a nearly finished cut with her mother in, in Beckley, just the four of us and our sound recordist, Steve. Um, and I think we went into that screening feeling like we think this is the best version of the film, but if there's any moment where either one of them is like, absolutely not, and we're not comfortable with that, you know, we, that would have led to a conversation around how we could address those concerns. Um, and I think that was really important to us because as Ben pointed out, there's a lot of vulnerability on display, in particular by Ayn, but a lot of the folks in the film really opened their lives to us in um, personal ways. And I'll just add, too, that I don't know if you felt this, Ayn, but it was just a constant conversation. I think at the end of every production trip, we asked you, are you okay with us continuing to go? Do you want us to come back? Um, and so I really think it was, at least from our perspective, we really tried to keep the dialogue constantly open and also ask for Ayn's input on, you know, where the story was going. And so I think just like that honesty and open, openness you would have with anyone in your life that you care about, um, we really tried to bring that to the situation because we genuinely care about Ayn and her mother and her family. Well, there, there was a lot of trust there, obviously, but as they said, there was over 400 hours of footage. So of course there's a lot of rambling or me talking about something or discussing something, but there, you know, they, they did ask how I felt about sharing certain things. I'm, I'm also the type of person that knows, and you know this at work too, if you type something on an email or you send it by text or you say it, it's, it can be repeated. So I, I knew whatever they were filming could be repeated and so that I didn't really say or do anything that I wouldn't be ashamed to show people and that's who I am anyway, so it was okay with me. Hi. 
Beautiful film, really appreciate it. I'm just curious, you know, it sounded like it was a long film, it took a long time. I'm curious to know maybe from uh, Dr. Amjad's perspective especially, um, did what you set out to accomplish in the film, you know, maybe if you, if you could share what you did think maybe it would become uh, and what it actually became, how different were they? Um, and uh, at the end of this, you know, what are you hoping maybe people will get from this? It's, it's definitely nothing that I expected or had any inkling or anticipation of. I knew we wanted to highlight the story of the people in Minden, draw attention to the story and the people who live there and of all the efforts that have been going on. So, you know, it, to me it was just another approach to do that. We were trying to shine a light on the town that has been going through a lot and not getting what they would like or deserve. Um, it's, it's not really, I guess, a happy outcome in my perspective because the idea was to relocate people um, and so that's disappointing to me but um, the idea is really for people to see this film and maybe either one use it as a tool to see how they can organize their their communities to better serve themselves um, how they can attend meetings and and do things maybe better or worse I don't know I also hope it helps people learn how to have um, thoughtful communications we talk about communicating a lot and that goes from personal lives or professional lives, but you know, it also, for environmental health, we always want quantitative data, and we, we forget about the qualitative, historical, legacy data, and people that are involved. You know, we, as agencies, we want data, data, data to prove something, but at the end of the day, that's still a person that we have to think about, and I, we forget that. So for me, I want someone, we'll say at the EPA level or government level, to see this and say, hey, we might do it this way, but we can also pivot and think of another way. Not everything has to be done the same in every town that has this kind of problem. So I, I really hope a lot of people just look at it and can take different things from it. But that's what I take from this film. And just to, I think that was a great answer. And just to make a really, or share a really concrete example. On Tuesday, we're headed to Philadelphia. We're gonna be sharing the film with the EPA and the West Virginia DEP. And we intend to have a really um, open-ended dialogue with them um, about the topics that I just described, or especially around communication. So we hope to do more of that in the future. I'll add just one thing, which is uh, you asked if we accomplished what we set out to accomplish. And I think, as you probably guessed, watching the first 20 or 30 minutes of the film, what we really hoped would happen in the beginning is that Ayn would re relocate the entire town and it would just be this heroic story where she had a bold vision, she set out to accomplish it, and she did, and everyone saved, and there's a nice little bow on it at the end. I think because we had a certain preconception of what heroism looks like, and I think we're a culture that is very preoccupied, particularly in this moment, with the idea of heroes and heroism. And there's something really beautiful about watching Ayn struggle and ultimately not succeed, but get up day after day and make peace with the decisions that she's made and recommit herself to sacrificing anew for people that she may not even have that much in common with. It's a truer definition of heroism because it's not based on your material achievement. It's based on your mindset of self-sacrifice and it's small and it often goes unnoticed. Um, and one of the things that I'm really grateful for this film for is that we got to capture a little piece of that specific brand of true heroism. And it's something that I think about a lot when I watch the film, Ayn, is that I don't think I could ever be you and as, as selfless as you are in this film, but it makes me want to try that much more watching your example. Congratulations, it was awesome. Um, question is, being that the results were not probably what everybody would have hoped for and anticipated, do you feel like the mission is still there? What's the current standing of everybody in the town? Do people accept the results? Do you feel that there's pushback or resentment about the results? Or do you feel like this has maybe helped focus people to go and look at things in a different perspective? Yeah, this is sort of the question at the end of the film. It's a really good question, and I'm really glad you asked it. I think this film asks audiences to do 
a really difficult thing, which is to hold two truths in mind simultaneously. One truth is that there was a great injustice that occurred in this place. It's almost certain, as so many people in the film say, that there were astronomically elevated rates of cancer in this community as a result of prolonged exposure to PCBs. But the simultaneous truth that the results sort of point to, and I would preface this by saying we are just documentary filmmakers who are trying just to capture the information that becomes available to us, we do not position ourselves as scientists, is that the imminent danger of those PCBs seems to have faded. Um, that does not discount the decades of suffering that people in Menden have undergone as a result of these carcinogenic chemicals. It's still a great travesty, and they are still owed some sort of restitution for that suffering. But what we hope comes out of the results at the end of the film, which, by the way, we were incredibly surprised by, right? Like, we engaged specifically in the blood test because we felt it was important to try to definitively answer this question. What is the current level of danger in Menden? Um, and obviously, we were surprised by what the blood tests revealed. But I hope the conversation that comes from this is, how do we get on the same page around what the current realities are? How do we communicate more respectfully with each other and acknowledge, as Meg and Ayn have said, this history of suffering, which is just as relevant today, even if the level of danger is not the same as it once was. The history of loss and suffering is still a factor that must be acknowledged. And I think the EPA, frankly, could do a much better job at keeping that in mind as they communicate with the residents of Minden. Um, so most people were expecting to see high levels and the people that live there. We'll say Susie and Butter, who's in the film. But when we did the blood test, the levels were, as you saw, like average American. The problem we have with that is, and we talked to the um, scientist, Emery, who really focuses on PCBs, we really don't know what that means. Just like any other carcinogen or health issue, we don't know if you know one part per million is going to affect me differently than it does Meg versus Scott. We don't know if it's high now. If it's low now, maybe it was higher 20 years ago. What did that do to our health? No one can say that, and that's the biggest problem that we have with cancer in, in Minden. Is there's no the chicken or the egg? Which came first? No one can answer that. And so that's the problem I think people in Minden have. They have already seen people that they have known 40 years ago die of cancer living in that small town. And you saw that road that Butter was pointing to those houses. I've lived in the same community in Beckley for 40 years. We know all our neighbors. They don't have cancers. So to me, that's what I'm talking about when I say there's common sense there. It just doesn't make sense that if you all lived in this certain vicinity, why every other person has a cancer. That's not genetics or bad luck. That's environment to me. And that's why I kept saying, you know, people are samples, not just dirt, because we use those, those types of quantity that just doesn't make sense. But that's where we are, and that's what I hope people take from that, that you can't give definitive answers to people and say, no, that didn't cause your problem. You, sh you should say, I don't know. I don't have a problem saying that. Another crazy thing that kind of gets lost at the end of the film, because there's a lot of information that's thrown at you at the end, is that these chemicals, PCBs, are ubiquitous. Like Meg and I tested our blood simultaneous with the members of the community uh, that we subjected to testing, and we have just as much PCB in our system as Butter and Susie. Um, and that is a depressing reality, because what that means in part is that part of, part of what makes it so difficult to have conversations in Menden is that, man, there are PCBs, there probably were more than the average level of PCB there, but there's also just PCBs everywhere, in almost every environment on Earth that we have been subjected to uh, and are in our bloodstream to some small degree. Um, and that is sort of a depressing reality to contend with. I actually have two questions. One is, um, aren't there other areas that could have been tested? Um, other markers, carcinogens? Uh, first of all, uh, and then second of all, um, uh, my wife and I went to a high school. There was a high percentage of cancer in the area, uh, and the, then, then we found out that uh, there was a dump site very close to the, the high school, et cetera, et cetera. But, 
and they covered it. They put all these tons of concrete over top of it and all this stuff. But um, I, I just the thought comes to my mind is there's there's other towns like Minden, and and I know you know this, uh, Dr. Amja, and uh, and I'm wondering is there a, a desire to go other places to help some of these other towns with the same stories that you have lived through, and maybe even the, the people that Amendon have lived through that can be helpful to try and get th something done differently uh, than was done at Minden. Yeah, I mean, it's something we talked about a lot as we were, as we were making Impossible Talent. We talked a lot about it, not just Meg and I, but also with, with Ayn, how symbolic Menden is of other communities that have suffered environmental contamination and environmental injustice and neglect by government institutions. And Meg and I always feel as storytellers that the most poignant way to make an audience member feel something about an issue is to get really specific and really personal, which is why we focused on just a handful of characters and tried to go deep with those characters. But there's certainly an opportunity to tell similar stories about so many different communities across the US, not just in West Virginia, but in every state. And I know it's something that was top of mind for Ayn as she took her role at the state level as the state health officer, was this idea that there are, there are so many Mendens across West Virginia. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that at all, Ayn, but it, I, I think at one point you told us that that was part of your rationale for stepping into that state role. It was like you felt like you could do more good at that higher level. I'll just add one thing. I, I do think there's an opportunity to share this film with communities that have um, recently experienced environmental contamination. Like we've talked a lot about East Palestine, like sharing this film with them so they can kind of, there, I'm sure there are lessons to be taken away in terms of, you know, how to communicate with the EPA and how they're communicating back with the community. So our hope is that we can share the film widely in that sense as well. Yeah, there's, as you probably saw in the film, there's this scary element of a, of a sort of ticking clock that's at play with communities that have been exposed to these chemicals. The more years that pass, the more difficult it becomes to draw a concrete link between rates of cancer and initial exposure. And so I do think there is a kind of warning present for communities that have experienced these types of traumas more recently. Um, to not let too much time pass before you try to make these links because it just gets harder and harder. Hey guys. Um, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Amjad. I think it's amazing that you were vulnerable enough and willing to do this and, and even to Butter and Susie and the community. I think traditionally we avoid conflict and there is sort of a conflictual element in the film, of course, between the EPA and the community, the past and the present. So I just want to say thank you for allowing this to continue. But also, there are, I think, levels of courage, you know, beyond even just in the participants, like you all as filmmakers have created what may be traditionally seen as a non-genre, non-commercial sort of film. And I think at any point you could have stopped and you continued for four, four years. And I'd love to hear from a filmmaking standpoint, why did you continue, how did you continue, and you know, for the aspiring folks out here, like what lessons have been learned? Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I mean, we, <laughs> it's funny, I, I, we just couldn't stop. I mean, we just felt like we had to see the story to its conclusion, and there were many moments as Scott alluded to along the process where we were like, you know, so many surprises. Um, and I would say the biggest surprise in many ways was when we got the blood results, we were already in the rough cut. And we really had to pivot and rethink the story from beginning to end as a result of that. But I do think that for us in terms of what we learned, I mean, we set out to tell, I think, a much more traditional environmental justice story but I'm so um, grateful that we had the opportunity to tell the story that we did because I think it's actually going to be a much more helpful tool um, for communities like Minden, for government institutions like the EPA, because I think it offers a much more nuanced and complicated reality that needs to be talked about. Um, and so 
I'm not really sure why we kept going. I think we're very stubborn. Um, and obviously, Ayn and the folks in uh, Minden had devoted so much time to the story, so we, we felt, um, you know, we really had to see that through. But I am ultimately grateful for the path that we took and the film that we ended up with. Yeah, I, I think in so many ways, making a feature-length documentary is a journey from being intrigued by an issue to really falling in love with the characters in your film. And I think that happened for us. As Ayn said, we became close friends at some point, probably at the end of year one, year two of, of filming. And rather than be crushed by the difference between the story we expected to tell and the story that we realized we were capturing, we actually just sort of leaned into how much we enjoyed spending time with the various folks in Minden and Ayn and the interesting things that were happening in their lives and trusted, and it is sort of a leap of faith, that those things might come together in some interesting way and make sense at the end of the process. Um, and that's super scary, but it's, it's also kind of what's exciting about nonfiction filmmaking is that it is a leap of faith and you do subject yourself to the whims of fate to some extent. Um, so I have another filmmaking question. So you end up with 400 hours of footage. Talk to us a little bit about what that process is like, either as you're going on or at the end of wading through that and starting to, to find a story from 400 hours of stuff. I'm going to let Scott mostly take this question, but I will say that Scott was very determined from the outset because he's an amazing editor that he was going to edit the film. And we had so much footage and it was so overwhelming and we were obviously so close to the story and all of our participants. Um, and we, we finally decided to bring on an editor, this really talented guy, Daniel Roman, and he waited through every single hour of footage. Um, and he put together a four hour assembly for us. And we met with him weekly and we just, it really forced us to have hard conversations about you know, characters we couldn't include in the story, um, what themes and threads felt really important. Um, and I just, I don't think we could have done it without Dan. We needed that third party to bounce ideas off of and, you know, just help us understand and grapple with the content. Um, and then Scott did take over the edit eventually. He spent six months editing it and turned it into the beautiful thing that it is. Um, but I do think that collaboration was really important. And I think it was in terms of learning opportunities for us, because we shoot and edit all of our short films, it was a learning opportunity to say, you know, we actually need help with this um, and to bring someone else into our process. And I'm so grateful that we did. Yeah, I mean, one of the more heartbreaking components of starting with 400 hours and then whittling down to 90 minutes is that you spend time with so many other people who have interesting stories in their own right that for various reasons just don't end up in the final cut of the film. And some of those people are here this evening. Um, Aneta, I know you're here, Markela, both of whom dedicated countless hours to filming with us uh, and have beautiful stories um, and just solely for the reason of trying to create something that's, you know, not four hours long that people um, lose patience with, you have to whittle down and make really, really tough decisions. Uh, a beautiful film, absolutely. Thank you so much for creating it and spending all the time you did. Um, I just wanted to ask what the next steps are and what are your, what are your hopes uh, for the outcome of the film and uh, even beyond the film too, uh, beyond Menden, what are some of the um, things that you hope to achieve or what's, what's some of your future that you imagine um, in your work as well? Um, to, to be honest, I, I don't know what else we to do. Um, I, to me, the latest thing, I guess, for Menden is, you know, and I think there was something in the paper which I didn't get to read, but... Um, the EPA did come down for a meeting, has set aside some funds, and I believe they're going to use that for cleanup efforts. Um, I had tried to convince them to use that money for a fund where the people in Minden can um, use it for either health, you know, health payments, fixing their houses, moving out, whatever the community decided to do. Um, but since that didn't seem to go th that way, I, I don't know what else. I think. Um, 
Someone mentioned if we've tested for other carcinogens or other chemicals, those discussions were brought up. It just hasn't been done yet. You, I saw in the videos, it's a flood, flood zone. Every time it rains really hard, that place is like a basin and becomes flooded. There's always issues there. So there are other things to do, I think, for the people that live there. Maybe not the PCB issue, but other things going on that might help. Um, but right now, we're just kind of floating. On a, on, well, I did go back to my private practice. I see patients two days a week, um, but I also still work with the state, uh, with the Department of Corrections uh, as their medical director. So I still wanted to be involved with people at the state level, trying to make uh, differences or changes in the way we do stuff. So I stayed on for that role, which is interesting in the learning curve. And um, but so I get to see patients, which is great. I didn't get to do that in my previous role. I still get to do some other things at that level. and. Um, and I also work at the Beckley VA emergency room on the weekends, which is fun because I like veterans. But um, so that, that's what I do. She's not busy at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think our hope is the same hope as most other filmmakers that we, you know, get to share the film as widely as possible. And it remains to be seen how we will accomplish that. But we are working on an impact campaign right now with our partners at the Redford Center, thinking about how we can share the film with government entities like the EPA and beyond, thinking about how we can um, elevate the story of leaders like Ayn and inspire folks to get involved in their community and also to have a conversation. I mean, it's interesting because we had the opportunity to screen the film in Los Angeles and Vermont and Colorado, and there were really different and interesting conversations that came out about how people see Appalachia, and so we hope that we can continue to screen the film outside of the region as well as in the region to continue those conversations, which I think you're gonna talk about. Yeah, it's interesting. There's like a couple things that I think we were trying to accomplish with the film. There's obviously this environmental justice and contamination component that we've been talking at length about, and it's, it's a messy situation, but we're hopeful that the film will help push the conversation to the next level, whatever that looks like. But there's an also a kind of unrelated component that just Meg, Meg just alluded to, which is that outside the state of West Virginia, we're hopeful that this film, as it plays for out-of-state audiences, will challenge some of these overly simplified perceptions of the type of person that lives in this state. And what I mean by that is, um, one of the first articles that we read when we were researching this story before we started filming was a Washington Post article about the situation in Minden titled, A Toxic Town, A Search for Answers. Uh, this was published on July 23rd, 2018. And it sort of details the history of contamination in Minden. It talks about Ayn and her father and the work that they were doing. Um, but it wasn't necessarily the article itself that struck us. It was the comments section of this article. Um, I wanna read some of the comments that jumped out to us as we were scrolling through. And this isn't representative of all the comments, but I would say maybe a solid 40 or 50%. Since West Virginia voted for Trump, why should they not be allowed to stew in their own toxic juices? Why are they whining? Menden will get exactly what it deserves. They love their racism and their ignorance more than they love their children's health, their children's education the air they breathe, and the water they drink. Why should I care about these people? And as anybody who's from West Virginia who leaves the state even for a brief amount of time will surely relate to, that is very painful to read. Um, and even when the story went awry and didn't look like the story we thought we were telling, we always knew that the people that we were following were lovable and had value as people and that in telling their stories we could push back on some of these hurtful and simplistic ideas of what West Virginians look like. And I'm happy to say that the few opportunities that we've had to screen the film out of state have really led to some interesting conversations about how quick we are to judge each other. And by the way, as a West Virginian I'm sometimes quick to judge other folks who are not from the state. But I hope that this film is a reminder that it's worth pausing uh, to check your preconceived notions about the people that you're interacting with who might not look or sound like you. 
Um, because I think that is the only way forward to amenable solutions to issues like the ones that Menden faces and so many other issues that are prevalent in our society today. So not to get on my high horse about it, but um, I'm happy to push back against some of those disgusting stereotypes that exist about people in the state. Does anybody else have any other questions from the audience? Well, if not, I mean, I think that was a really good note to end on. Um, thank you all for coming up here. Thank you all for sharing your time and, you know, giving people an inside look into, you know, this beautiful film that you've created and screened for us tonight. So thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming out.